Chúng tôi rằng trên lần thờ Khu Linh từ trước đến nay và vĩnh viễn của Dông Nhấn, Hòa Rân Tri và Bùn Rông. Vì thế chúng ta kính trọng nhung tiện bối và sự tiếp nói văn hóa tự mảnh đất này. I'd also like to do a shout out to um, the team at Liquid Architecture, Danny, Beth and Joel. Thank you for putting on this night. Um, yeah, it's been really amazing. I went to the first, the first one, which was Rapture, and really enjoyed Celeste's talk. Um, and I know that you can listen to it online if, if, um, if you missed out on that one. So definitely check it out. I'd also like to do a shout out to all the friends who've come here today. Thank you so much, and my family as well, um, and everyone here for being in this space and sharing this space with me today. Um, I'd like to say that today I speak and share with you a part of myself, speak from my own experiences, and do not represent all queer, pe queer people of color, nor do I represent all Vietnamese folks. However, I'd also like to say that my voice does not stand alone. My friends, chosen family, and family are like the belly of my body. Nurture me, feed me. My belly is a cave of love. It is a place where I do not yield to fear, but surrender to loving kindness. I hope that some of what I speak of tonight will ripple through your own bodies. So I'm going to start with a poem. Um, yeah, and this poem is called The Tongue That Falsifies. Why do you speak a tongue that falsifies. With every accent of your ancestors, paralyzed. The contours of grandma's stories, chiseled down by the master's tools. On this stolen land, your parents are grateful for. Behind your lips, you salivate the weapon on loan to you. <coughs> Collect, gather, sort, decipher, analyze and synthesize. Unroll the tongues that bind. But no, you cannot dismantle the master's house <coughs> with the master's tools. A colonizer's tongue See them as they see each other and imagine a staircase leading to a room, a room with no windows, a room of quiet lies, all tongues falsified. Do you remember the taste of mother's milk? One sucked on, one never forgets. The sweet, salty residue residing under your breath. So tonight's theme is Desire Industries, and so I'd like to start off with a story. Um, I've been thinking a lot about desires, and so it's fitting that I'm here tonight sharing with you all my thoughts on this topic. I like to think of desires as something that expands beyond the capitalist and patriarchal constructions of romance and consumption. Recently, navigating my way through Venus retrograde hell, <laughs> <laughs> also known as a time for reflecting on our relationships, I found myself feeling attracted to all kinds of people. Writing intense and intimate emails with a friend, having three hour Skype dates with a person in Seattle who I had met on OkCupid, and feeling drawn to some friends in new and exciting ways that wasn't like, I wanna date this person and kiss them, but more like, wow, they're so special and I wanna keep learning from them and be around them all the time. I then started to think more deeply about the role of desire in my life. Which brings me to the next story. Initially, I was going to tell a Vietnamese folk tale of the birth of Vietnamese people, 
but I actually never heard this story growing up, and well, I'd like to share a story closer to my heart. I'd like to invite my mother, Catherine, up into the space for a bit. Please make her feel welcome. So my mum has willingly, um, and also I asked her as well if she could sing <laughs> some folk songs to me, which she sung to me as a baby. Um, and yeah, it's been, a, it's, a, it's been a long time since I've heard these songs, so, and she'll sing them to me in Vietnamese, and I will translate them after she's sung a few of them, and they're quite short and sweet, so. So that song is about um, walking on an unstable bridge, um, but that mother is holding, holding my hand and walking me across that bridge and walking the way of life. Mm. Goodbye. and the other one is sweet. Yeah. So that story is about life being bitter and sweet at the same time. Mm. Con cha như núi thấy sao Nghĩa mẹ như nước trong nguồn chảy ra Một lòng thơ mẹ kính cha Cho tròn đạo hiếu mới là phần con um, It's to say that um, as a child, um, being a child you need to love and honor your parents because of the <laughs> <laughs> and sort of respect yeah it's to do with respect and because of you know how they 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 give birth to you in that in that sense and that they um, take care of you and that that's just the way the culture is Come on, man. Please give my mom a hand.
Thank you, Mum. Um, so, thinking about those stories, um, I want to share another story. Um, I was in Vietnam earlier this year in June um, for three weeks, for which two of those weeks I spent in my grandma's on my dad's side um, hometown, which is called Hoi An. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it. It's a very popular town amongst tourists. So um, Hoi An is a, a coastal town just in central Vietnam. Um, so there was one week where I was living with four Vietnamese women, my Benoi, who is my grandma, my auntie, my grandma's niece and grandma's friend. Um, it was definitely an experience to live with four other Vietnamese women under one household um, and it was a very new and confronting experience but definitely learnt a lot. So it'd been a while since I visited my ancestral lands and I'd forgotten that every time I go there locals question me on um, if I look Vietnamese and looking Vietnamese. The conversation usually goes something like, I get really excited because I get to practice um, my mother tongue, a local will come up to me, ask me a question in English, and then I'll be like, oh, I'm Vietnamese in Vietnamese, and then they'll be really shocked, and then it'll be like, but you don't look Vietnamese, you look Thai or Cambodian, um, and then I'd be like, no, but my grandfather's from here, my grandma's from here, so it would always just go like that. And So one day I, I told my Benoi, um, my grandma, this story, that this was happening a lot. And the first thing she did was laugh at me um, in a really endearing way and said to me in Vietnamese, they're so surprised that you're Vietnamese because you look like a girl on top and a boy on the bottom. And I was wearing a single top and shorts. So, you know, it was such an interesting kind of experience. And my auntie then like interjected and was like, oh, you know, you can wear one of my dresses. And she's like 50. And, <laughs> Um, and then my grandma was like, Thai, which is like, no way in Vietnamese. Doesn't matter how you dress as long as you're intelligent. Um, and it was really sweet of her to say those things to me. Um, but it made me realise that Vietnamese people in Vietnam assume that, you know, someone like me born outside of Vietnam will dress a certain way and would be from a particular class. Like, they expect me to be wealthy um, and dress in a feminine way. So in that moment, class and gender became intimately entwined. And I asked myself, is this what it means to be a Vietnamese person living in the diaspora? Um, yeah, so the last time I was in Vietnam, which was maybe two or three years ago, I was way more comfortable in being um, more feminine presenting, I suppose, like wearing dresses and clothes that showed off my body a bit more. But since my last visit, I've changed, especially in how I see and feel my body. As someone who sees their body as transcending boundaries, never existing on either side, but always coming and going between, a body magnetized by contradictions, magnetized by tender masculinity and sometimes a fearless kind of femininity. Being in Vietnam this time around meant that I was suddenly confronted by the desires thrown onto me by Vietnamese women who I didn't know but shared some kind of history with. And I'd also like to say that that doesn't mean that Vietnam isn't a queer-friendly place, but that it's a different kind of queerness that exists there and that's kind of manifested there. Um, yeah, and I think those are really interesting things to think about if you're a queer person and you're traveling across, across lands, across places, across waters. Like, gender is a really different experience in every place you go to, and it can be confronting, but it can also be really exciting. So I was really enthralled by how Vietnamese women in Vietnam carry themselves. Asian women are too often conflated with being obedient and passive, yet all the Vietnamese women I met and know knew how to do everything from preparing the meat, bargaining, hustling, and looking after their families. The way Vietnamese women would link arms with their friends and walk down the streets together, they were valiant and compassionate. I felt so lucky to be invited into that. And the Vietnamese men, well, most of them would be walking around the streets with their bellies fully exposed. 
regardless of what size their bellies were, they were just happy to show it off and I found that really sweet. So, yeah. <laughs> and it was also very hot over there, so that's why they, they do that. <laughs> um, so how do you make a sense of a place whose politics and way of life are so foreign? Where to start? How can you feel nostalgic for a place where you haven't grown up? But it's true, the nostalgia is very real. And, well, what about this place here, where I was born? How to make sense of this place? In a lot of ways, this place is closer to my heart, complicated as it is. This is where I found my community of queer trans people of color, friends and family. This is my political home. This is where I've learned to care and love in ways that I feel are transformative. So what does this have to do with feminism, you might be asking? Well, where in the soundscape of feminist talk is there room for stories that have no end nor a beginning? Where in the soundscape of feminist talk is there room for not just amplification, but for the utterances, whispers, songs, and silences of those who are racially marginalized? Stories are not just about power, but about vulnerability. The vulnerability in searching for an elsewhere within. The vulnerability in opening up a shameful past. The vulnerability of being foreign in your mother's homeland. The vulnerability of choosing to be honest with and honor your bodily and political desires. These desires can barely be uttered by the colonizer's tongue, and yet somehow, at times, restrained by it. I'd like to now do a reading um, of a few passages by one of my favorite writers, filmmakers, academics, musician. She's just a multi-talented person. Um, so her name is Trinti Minha, and she wrote a book called Woman, Native Other. This is the book here. Um, and what I really love about it is um, a that it's, the way she writes isn't, I'd never come across her style of writing before. She's very poetic in the way she phrases things and it reminds me a lot of the Vietnamese language, um, which is very melodic and poetic. So perhaps that's why I was drawn to her. So I'm gonna read a few passages from the chapter Grandma's Stories. Let me tell you a story, for all I have is a story. Story passed on from generation to generation, named joy, told for the joy it gives the storyteller and the listener. Joy inherent in the process of storytelling. Whoever understands it also understands that a story, as distressing as it can be in its joy, never takes anything away from anybody. Its name, remember, is joy. It's double, woo, moro, show. Something must be said, must be said that has not been and has been said before. It will take a long time, but the story must be told. There must not be any lies. It will take a long time for living cannot be told not merely told, living is not livable. Understanding, however, is creating, and living, such an immense gift that thousands of people benefit from each past or present life being lived. The story depends upon every one of us to come into being. It needs us all, needs our remembering, understanding, and creating what we have heard today together to keep on coming into being. The story of a people, of us, peoples. Story, history, literature, all in one. They call it the primitive tool of man, the simplest vehicle of truth. 
When history separated itself from story, it started indulging in accumulation and facts, or it thought it could. It thought it could build up to history because the, because the past, unrelated to the present and the future, is lying there in its entirety, waiting to be revealed and related. The act of revealing bears in itself a magical, not factual, quality inherited undoubtedly from primitive storytelling. For the past perceived as such is a well-organized past whose organization is already given. Managing to identify with history, history thus manages to oppose the factual to the fictional, the story writer, the historian to the storyteller. As long as the transformation, manipulations, or redistributions inherent in the collecting of, of events are overlooked, the division continues its course, as sure of its itinerary as it certainly dreams to be. Story writing becomes history writing, and history quickly sets itself apart, consigning story to the realm of tale, legend, myth, fiction, literature. Then, since fictional and factual have come to a point where they mutually exclude each other, fiction, not infrequently, means lies, and fact, truth. Did it really happen? Is it a true story? Which truth, the question unavoidably arises. The story has been defined as a free narration, not necessarily factual, but truthful in character. It gives us human nature in its bold outlines, history in its individual details. Truth, not one, but two. Truth and fact. Just like in the old times when queens were born and kings were made in Egypt. Poetry, Aristotle said, is truer than history. Storytelling as literature must then be truer than history. If we rely on history to tell us what happened at a specific time and place, we can rely on the story to tell us not only what might have happened, but also what is happening at an unspecified time and place. No wonder that in old tales, storytellers are very often women, witches and prophets. The African Griot and Griot are well known for being poet, storyteller, historian, musician and magician all at once. But why truth at all? Why have this battle for truth on behalf of truth? I do not remember having asked grandmother once whether the story she was telling me was true or not. Neither do I recall her asking me whether the story I was reading her was true or not. We knew we could make each other cry, laugh or fear, but we never thought of saying to each other, this is just a story. A story is a story. There was no need for clarification, a need many adults considered natural or imperative among children, for there was no such thing as a blind acceptance of the story as lit literally true. Perhaps the story has just become a story when I have become adept at consuming truth as fact. Imagination is thus equated with falsification. And I'm made to believe that if accordingly I am not told or do not establish in so many words what is true and what is false, I or the listener may no longer be able to differentiate fancy from fact. Literature and history once were, still are, stories. This does not necessarily mean that the space that they form is undifferentiated but that this space can articulate on a different set of principles, one which may be said to stand outside the hierarchical realms of facts. On the other hand, each society has its own politics of truth. On the other hand, being truthful is being in the in-between of all regimes of truth. Outside specific time, outside specialized space. Truth embraces with it all the other abstinations other than itself.
Truth is when it is itself no longer. Disuse, thought woman, <laughs> spider woman, griot, story talker, fortune teller, witch. If you have the patience to listen, she will take delight in relating it to you. <coughs> an entire history, an entire vision of the world, a lifetime story. Mother always has a mother. And great mothers are recalled as the goddesses of all waters, the sources of diseases and of healing, the protectresses of women and of childbearing. To listen carefully is to preserve, <laughs> but to preserve is to burn, for understanding means creating. The world's earliest archives or libraries were the memories of women patiently transmitted from mouth to ear, body to body, hand to hand. In the process of storytelling, speaking and listening refer to realities that do not involve just the imagination. The speech is seen, heard, smelled, tasted and touched. It destroys, brings into life, nurtures. Every woman partakes in the chain of guardianship and of transmission. In Africa, it is said that every griot who dies is a whole library that burns down. Phrases like, I sucked it at my mother's breast, or I have it from our mother, to express what has been passed down by the elders are common in this part of the world. Tell me and let me tell my hearers what I've heard from you, who heard it from your mother and your grandmother, so that what is said may be guarded and unfailingly transmitted to the women of tomorrow, who will be our children and the children of our children. These are the opening lines she used to chant before embarking on a story. I owe that to you, her and her, who owe it to her, her and her. I memorize, recognize, and name my sources, not to validate my voice through the voice of an authority, for we, women, have little authority in the history of literature, and wise women never draw their powers from authority, but to evoke her and sing. The bond between women and word, among women themselves, to produce their full effect, words must indeed be chanted rhythmically, in cadences, off cadences. In this chain and continuum, I am but one link. The story is me, neither me nor mine. It doesn't really belong to me, and while I feel greatly responsible for it, I also enjoy the irresponsibility of the pleasure obtained through the process of transferring. Pleasure in the copy pleasure in the reproduction. No repetition can ever be identical, but my story carries with it their stories, their history, and our story repeats itself endlessly despite our persistence in denying it. I don't believe it. That story couldn't have happened today. Then, someday our children will speak about us here present, about those days when things like that could happen. Every gesture, every word involves the past, present, and future. The body never stops accumulating, and years and years have gone by mine without me being able to stop them, stop it. My sympathies and grudges appear at the same time familiar and unfamiliar to me. I dwell in them, they dwell in me, and we dwell in each other, more as guests than as owner. My story, no doubt, is me, but it is also, no doubt, older than me. Younger than me, older than the humanized, unmeasurable, uncontainable, so immense that it exceeds all attempts at humanizing. But humanizing we do, and also overdo. For the vision of a story that has no end, no end, no middle, no beginning, no start, no stop, no progression, neither backward nor forward, only a stream that flows into another stream, an open sea is the vision of a mad woman. 
the unleashed tides of mutedness, as Clarice Lispector puts it. We fear heights, we fear the headless, the bottomless, the boundless. And we are in terror of letting ourselves be engulfed by the depths of muteness. This is why we keep on doing violence to words, to tame and cook the wild roar, to adopt the vertiginously infinite. Truth does not make sense. It exceeds meaning and exceeds measure. It exceeds all regimes of truth. So when we insist on telling over and over again, we insist on repetition in recreation and vice versa. On distributing the story into smaller portions that will correspond to the capacity of absorption of our mouths, the capacity of vision of our eyes and the capacity of bearing of our bodies. Each story is at once a fragment and a whole, a whole within a whole. And the same story has always been changing. For things which do not shift and grow cannot continue to circulate. Dead. Dead times, dead words, dead tongues. Not to repeat in oblivion. So, Minha states that we have a responsibility as keepers and transmitters of our ancestors' stories. However, what happens when the rhythm of our ancestors' stories have been broken? Where can we begin to connect one? Where can we begin to connect one fragment of a story to another? What happens when we have not tasted mother's milk? For those who have experienced displacement due to colonialism, experienced loss because of war, for those born in the diaspora, for those who experienced dysphoria in the diaspora, for those who have lost their homelands, for those who have had their homelands stolen from them, the taste of mother's milk is like powder, dry, tasteless and fragmented. White supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy impact on our abilities to not only recall the utterances, songs, and cries of our ancestors, but to keep them alive through adding our own rhythm into grandma's never-ending thread. Rather than mending and weaving in our own beings into our ancestors' stories, we as second-gen migrants, children of the diaspora, immigrant, other, spend so much time defending and piecing together our identities on gender, sexuality, race, religion, to name a few. Whilst it is important to reconstruct and build on a narrative as people of color in the diaspora, I am asking myself, how can I, as a queer, mixed, racialized person born on stolen land, start to weave a narrative that is beyond my identity? One that does not falsify the words of my ancestors and yet does not erase the stories of indigenous peoples whose lands have been and still are stolen. So, given all these struggles we are grappling with, what can possibly assist us to not only survive but thrive? How can we be honest with the stories that have not only been passed on to us by our ancestors, but the stories we create within our chosen families? and how to unsettle and transform the structures that have been forced upon us. Tonight, I'm not sure if there are any clear answers, because a story, one so rich and complex, is never revealed in one sitting. Though, we might like to think about what Minha means when she writes, to listen carefully is to preserve, but to preserve is to burn, for understanding means creating. Thank you.